Um, welcome to the third and the last session um, for today. Um, I'm very honored to be moderating this session. It's uh, move, um, Stability and Movement. The title itself is very interesting and we all see um, these two elements in all the societies that we live in. Uh, let me introduce um, our first speaker. So the format of this session is going to be, um, I will introduce um, each speaker just before their talk and we try to wrap up and then and Q&A. Same format as the last session, each speaker will have approximately 25 to 30 minutes um, and then we'll come back for the Q&A session for them to elaborate further on the point. Okay, the first speaker of today for the, this session is Professor Dr. Andrew James Harding. He's the director of the um, Center for Asian uh, Legal Study at the National University of Singapore. Um, his talk is titled Constitutionalism in Transition in Myanmar, Evolving Knowledge, Formidable Challenges, and the Creation of Practice. So this is the one case in point. Myanmar is definitely a good choice to pick to, to represent how it the forces between stability, people who would like to have the country a bit stable or to remain the same status quo, and another group of people who would like to see the country move forward. Okay, um, I'll give the floor to Professor Harding. Right, um, ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here for this very, very interesting seminar and I enjoyed the, the afternoon session very much which was very thought provoking. Uh, this is now the, I think this is the third time in ten months that I've been giving, giving a talk here at Tamasat University Faculty of Law so I'm grateful to be persisted with and uh, please do carry on in inviting me and I hope that I satisfy your, your requirements or continue to satisfy your requirements in this, in this regard. I must apologize for the terrible photo of me in the, in the handbook, which make, makes me look like an ogre. I'm really much nicer than that, I can assure you. Um, okay, I, I, was, uh, I was especially enthralled with uh, Mark Saxon's presentation earlier on, which spoke very directly to some of the things uh, that I've been thinking about and doing in relation to Myanmar, because it is really a, a classic example in many ways of the problems of transition, uh, but unlike the earlier speakers who looked at this from the point of view of social factors, political economy and technology, I'm looking at this as a constitutional lawyer. Um, so that's just uh, symbolizing the moment that uh, Myanmar finds itself in uh, with the, uh, you know, the famous wooden bridge near Mandalay. So, um, this is kind of possibly a bridge towards the future and I think everybody is agreed that the Constitution is a very fundamental issue in Myanmar right now. Um, let's first of all just look a bit at the historical background of constitutionalism in Myanmar. It's not a new concept, in fact it goes uh, some way back uh, in history. So I, we could probably start, I think, with the famous Panglong Agreement in 1947, uh, which was brokered by General Aung San and brought the minorities on board with the constitutional process that was then taking place. The Constitution was drafted and brought into force in 1948 after uh, Burma, as it was then called, became independent. And as I'm sure you know, unfortunately, Aung San was assassinated before that took place. And that was probably a key event that undermined the possibility of constitutionalism in Myanmar over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, there was then a period of about 14 years of democratic rule which disintegrated with the advancing ethnic problems which in some ways can be attributed to the Panglong Agreement in the sense 
but that agreement did not include all of the minorities and many of the provisions, if we can call them that, in the Panglong Agreement uh, were never actually properly implemented and were not included properly within the constitutional process. Now, those facts have tremendous resonance at the present moment, as I'll explain a little bit later on. After initially the military had in, been invited in as a caretaker government, General Ne Win finally took over the government with a military coup in 1962, which put an end to the 1948 constitution. And between 1962 and 1974, Burma was governed without any constitution at all. There were just military decrees. So essentially, this was a complete denial of constitutionalism and the rule of law. Eventually, a constitution was drafted that was brought in in 1974, uh, which was based on a, a, rather, uh, a rather interesting, perhaps even ironic model. It was Yugoslavia that was the model for the 1974 uh, constitution. And I guess the thinking was that if you had um, a socialist one-party state with numerous uh, different ethnic minorities, then maybe Yugoslavia under Marshal Tito was the way to go. Um, but obviously from the perspective of 2014, this would be a terribly unfortunate choice uh, to make. So again, the ethnic issue is at the heart of what is happening in Myanmar. Now, uh, after the um, mass protests in 1988 and the failed election process in which the the NLD was uh, elected by a large majority, but the military leaders refused to recognize the election result. The military then embarked on a constitutional process, and basically um, for about 16 years or so, uh, between 1992 and 2008, a process to draft a new constitution Proceeded. Sometimes it was on, sometimes it was off. At one point, the NLD walked out of the convention never to return. But, and nobody really took this process terribly seriously. It was just, they said, the military playing for time rather than serious engagement with the possibility of constitutional government. But eventually, the 2008 constitution came into force and this was described as a roadmap to democracy. And, you know, at the time, it's only six years ago, but at the time, very few people gave this constitution any credence at all. It was dismissed immediately as a meaningless piece of paper, a very long piece of paper. It has more than 400 articles. And, I mean, really, if you wanted a piece of paper to, as a veneer for military rule, why would you draft a constitution with 400 articles? Articles maybe 27 would be uh, would be quite enough. Uh, but anyway, that's what what happened. And uh, so this constitution was brought into force amid great skepticism internationally, particularly because if you remember, in 2008 there was a referendum on this new constitution, um, and during the middle of this referendum, um, Cyclone Nargis hit Myanmar and disrupted uh, the process and in a sense the process disrupted the relief efforts to help all the people in southern Myanmar who suffered um, terribly because of this um, awful uh, this awful event and that brought the regime into even more disrepute and there was even more skepticism about the real intention of the generals now, there's one detail that appeals to me reading about what happened in 2008, and that is that one of the provincial governors, whose name was General Tain Sein, was flying in his helicopter over the very area that was devastated. Uh, he was the governor responsible for the main area that was devastated by the cyclone, and by his own account, he looked down at the devastation and felt 
a sense of absolute helplessness that after 50 years of military government there seemed to be nothing that the government could do for all these people uh, who suffered in that in that way and he became determined at that moment that change was going to was going to happen at least that's his version of what happened in 2008 and of course eventually Tain Sein became the president of Myanmar following the elections that were then held under the 2008 constitution in 2010 so at the end of 2010 um, uh, Tain Sein was uh, uh, chosen by uh, parliament as the, the president of, of Myanmar and again people were skeptical saying well this is rather, just a rather user-friendly general as opposed to a brutal and nasty one um, and it doesn't really change anything much but um, the really striking event if we can just go to the next slide please um, was um, the by-elections in 2012 and what happened here was that Tain Sein was able to persuade Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD to participate in the political process. And that was obviously quite a feat, considering the background of the previous 20 years um, that I've just, uh, I've just described. The by-elections had to be held because um, members of parliament who became ministers in the government had to vacate their seats. I think this is something that's happened a few times in Thailand, so you probably um, are familiar with this situation. And uh, so the NLD uh, competed in these by-elections and they won all but two of the seats that were, uh, that were available and thereby established an opposition, a genuine opposition uh, in Parliament for the first time and a toehold in the political process. Now obviously this wasn't an easy decision to make given the skepticism about the intentions of the regime. Was the NLD just signing up um, to uh, uh, some sort of a suicide pact or, um, you know, or, or was this actually the beginning of something quite new and important and obviously Aung San Suu Kyi was persuaded that there was enough possibility of the latter um, not to worry too much about, about the former. Um, now the NLD has always insisted, like many others, that um, as complete a document as the 2008 constitution apparently is, it still uh, is only the basis for further change and there are a number of difficulties with this constitution, as I will, uh, as I will point out, uh, and lo and behold, and again, this was not predicted by really hardly hardly anybody predicted this would happen. In uh, 2013, it was announced that a constitutional review process would be commenced, which brought into question the provisions on constitutional amendments and how those should be implemented. Uh, so there was uh, public consultation uh, began and initially representations were supposed to be in by the 31st of December 2013 that was then extended various committees were set up Parliament was basically overwhelmed with the numbers of responses in the hundreds of thousands uh, to the uh, proposal for constitutional review because they didn't uh, say what the parameters of the review might be so people uh, came up with all sorts of ideas but it was interesting to see which issues they latched onto as being particularly important. Now we'll come back to the review process but just to mention that this has been hinged to the next general election which is to be held by the end of 2000. 15, because that will be five years after the 2010 uh, election. So the idea is that the amendments would be passed before the 2015 election takes place. Now whether this will actually happen remains an interesting question of transition. Um, how quickly can this be accomplished? Uh, Mark Sachs has said it should be done safely and quickly or as quickly as can be done safely some such expression you use well here's a here's a case in point 
uh, how quickly can Myanmar change constitutionally? How quickly should Myanmar change constitutionally? Because there are grave dangers as well as grave possibilities in this situation. <clears throat> um, so, okay, just standing back from Myanmar for a moment, I mean, how do you accomplish constitutional change? Um, now, constitutional lawyers will tell you something like this, that you can, of course, create a new constitution or replace the constitution by some sort of constituent assembly or convention. Now, I don't think in Thailand you need to be told that because that's happened many times uh, in, in this city over the last, uh, over the last few, few decades. So you know what a constitutional convention or a constitutional drafting assembly, as you call it, here in Thailand, you know what that is. Constitutions can also change by in, uh, judicial interpretation, particularly, for example, in the area of, of fundamental rights uh, or balances of power within a, a, a federal structure, that sort of thing. This tends to happen in constitutions that are quite rigid because they, it may be very difficult uh, to accomplish constitutional change in any other way than through ju judicial interpretation. But obviously there are limits to judicial interpretation and you always confront this kind of problem of interpreting constitutions, which is when the constitution is, is crystallized in a text, do you implement the original intention of the drafters of the constitution? Or do you regard the constitution as a kind of evolving document where words can change their meaning over time. So that's the essential dilemma involved in judicial interpretation. I don't want to go into resolving that dilemma, but it does exist. <clears throat> you can also pass legislation insofar as the Constitution allows or, or sometimes demands that legislation be, be passed. So change to some extent can be accomplished by organic laws, for example, or by fulfilling um, remits that are set out in the, in the Constitution itself. You can also change a Constitution to some extent by constitutional practice, such as the evolution of conventions and practices that seem to accumulate around Constitutions rather in the way that barnacles accumulate uh, around a ship. I don't know if the translators can translate barnacles, but anyway, some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, but of course, most importantly, you can amend the actual text of the Constitution, and that's really what we're talking about uh, in, in Myanmar. Although, let me just note that all of, the, all of the other things have been happening as well. So constitutional change has been happening, but if you want to accomplish major changes, then you really have to deal with the, fundamentally with the text of the Constitution. Thanks. <clears throat> Now, of course, when it comes to looking at the amendment provision, let's just make the point straight away that whatever the amendment provision itself um, says um, is only going to be a minimal requirement, the minimum that is necessary to make the amendment valid. But I think everybody accepts that that's not the whole story and that you need extensive debate about constitutional change before it's going to be legitimate and before it's going to be implemented. But what is the scope of constitutional amendment? Because constitutional lawyers, they are not necessarily in agreement about this. In India, for example, the Supreme Court has laid down what they call the basic structure doctrine in a case called Keshavananda in 1973, they said the Constitution has a basic structure which cannot be amended. And the Constitution itself doesn't say anything like that. It just provides a process for amendment by two-thirds majority in both houses. But the Supreme Court said not so fast because you can't destroy the Constitution by amending it. An amendment assumes there's still something left and what is left is the basic structure. So it's a compelling argument. And I'll explain in a moment why that's relevant in, in Myanmar. Now, of course, some constitutions say 
you know, that there are provisions that just can't be amended. I mean, Germany is an example of of, of country where you know some provisions just can't be amended. So you'd have to replace the entire constitutional order if you wanted to amend those those provisions. Um, but having said that, obviously most provisions in most constitutions, you know, can be amended just by going through the process that allows for constitutional change. The problem obviously is going to be how easy or hard should it be to change the constitution. I'm going to come on to that in a moment. So, um, you know, there's no consensus around this. People have different ideas about how constitutional change should be brought about. Um, and Thailand is very interesting in this respect because if you look at the constitutions that have been drafted, it usually looks very easy to change the constitution because you only need a majority in the legislature to change the constitution. In addition to that, there's obviously also the extra or quasi-constitutional mechanism of the military coup, which has accomplished constitutional changes controversially, obviously, on many, on many occasions. Okay, let's have another slide. So, um, so Myanmar is going through this process of public debate about constitutional change. Some systems require a special majority in parliament. Sometimes it's two thirds or, or three quarters of the, of the members, usually of both houses, if there are two houses of parliament. Um, usually there is a requirement that there be an, a, 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 an express uh, proposal for amendment. In other words, you could not amend the constitution by accident just by passing a law that is inconsistent with the constitution. Most constitutions say that you know, nothing else should be included in the bill and it should be expressly for the purpose of constitutional amendment. Uh, getting by the uh, possibility of an implied or accidental amendment of the constitution. Um, some countries um, require a referendum so that any changes have a majority of popular support and in federal systems very often there's a requirement that a proportion of the subjects of the federation or the states or provinces um, consent to the amendment before it can be brought into effect. Um, so that applies in the United States for example. Um, and then other countries require a, a national convention as though a, not, a new constitution has been drafted in Philippines is interesting because they have a possibility of national convention, but also uh, a people's initiative, a public petition, can be presented for constitutional amendment. But the fundamental point is that in order to achieve legitimacy as opposed to legal validity, um, you need to have extensive debate and to reflect those debates in the constitutional changes that, that take place. All right, now here's the position in Myanmar. Um, the relevant sections are 433 to 6, and basically you'll see you need a 75% majority in both houses of the legislature, plus a majority in favor in a referendum in relation to most of the really important provisions in the Constitution. So there are actually two ways of amending. In both cases you need a 75% majority, but in some cases you need approval in, at a referendum as well. And uh, so this is 75% of the total membership of both houses, and the referendum there has to be a majority of all eligible voters, not just um, those who choose to cast their vote. Uh, so this is what we would inevitably call a very rigid constitution. It looks like the constitution was designed not to be changed. And yet now there seems to be a consensus that it should be changed. So you see how things can change very quickly in terms of perception about change itself. <coughs> um, so there, there has to be no mixing of provisions with any others. There has to be an express amendment. You can't have an implied amendment. 
Uh, also, 20% of members of the legislature can propose an, uh, an amendment. Now, the problem in Myanmar, as you probably know, is that 25% of the members of each house of parliament are drawn from the military. So they're literally just appointed on a certain kind of system uh, by the uh, commander-in-chief of the armed forces. And if you add that to the rigidity of the amendment provision, you can see that you have a very rigid constitution indeed, because effectively what we are saying is that no constitutional amendment can be passed unless, unless the commander-in-chief says it's okay. So the constitution effectively is held hostage by the commander-in-chief because he can call on the votes of any of the, those 25% of members. Um, not always, actually. Sometimes, you know, there have been issues where, uh, where the military members have voted against um, the party line, as it were, but there hasn't been too much comeback. But, I mean, ultimately, uh, the commander-in-chief can call on his position to demand support from those members who owe, owe their positions to him. Um, the army commander can also nominate four ministers and the president has to accept those nominations and they are in charge of very sensitive uh, portfolios like uh, defense and, um, uh, uh, and security and peripheral areas and so on. Um, now, there, as I've indicated, there are two levels of, um, of entrenchment. One where a referendum is required, another where it's not required. And what I want to suggest here, coming back to basic structure, is that the Myanmar constitution has defined its own basic structure by saying that some provisions um, you know, cannot be amended except with a referendum. Uh, but that would mean that if a referendum is in favor of change, then it would not be capable of being judicially reviewed on this theory as it would be if the same thing happened in India because the basic structure is not implied here as in India. It's stated very, very clearly that there are these two levels of entrenchment of provisions. But that's speculative. I mean, there is a constitutional tr tribunal in, in Myanmar and uh, these are kind of issues that eventually will come to that tribunal and the judges will have to decide that. There is a problem here in terms of knowledge and challenges that the expertise in constitutional law in Myanmar, as in other areas of law, is extremely limited at the moment. But that's an issue on which a lot of people are, are working at this moment to try and improve the, the understanding of constitutional issues, not just among lawyers and judges, but amongst the political class and the population in general. Uh, so in terms of these, these levels of entrenchment, the all-important chapter one and the emergency powers, and these are really important provisions, are entrenched by the referendum requirement. But oddly enough, fundamental rights, which you might think by their very nature are supposed to be fundamental, can be changed without the referendum requirement, so just the 75% majority. Um, so submissions were invited, about a third of the submissions were actually about the amendment process itself. That shows you how sophisticated the Myanmar people actually are on some of these, these issues because they realized that many of them, that the big problem constitutionally in Myanmar is the rigidity of the constitution. So a lot of people are asking that, well, you know, never mind the other issues, let's make the constitution more flexible and then we can move on to these other issues that, that arise. Um, so priority is being given in this process to the provisions that are entrenched by the referendum requirement. That's a statement from, from senior uh, members of, uh, of Parliament. Uh, a joint committee um, passed the submissions on to Parliament in February 2014 and they're still dealing with the overwhelming response to the invitation for participation. So it, it means that, that those sections that I just set out are going to have to be considered as, reconsidered as part of the, of the process.
So, coming back to a general question, in transition, do you make the constitution rigid or flexible? This is the dilemma. A rigid constitution is hard to amend, but it ensures stability with ch changes being only carefully considered, uh, but it can also block social, economic, or political development, and sometimes that happens more quickly than you expect, as in Myanmar. On the other hand, a flexible constitution is easy to, to amend. It can respond to changing circumstances. But constitutional protection rights, for example, may be overturned rather easily. And there may be backsliding or backtracking on political agreements that have already been made. Think back to Pang Long 1947. That is exactly what happened. Uh, so in terms of the 2008 constitution, I mean, undoubtedly, it's a very rigid constitution, and uh, therefore most people are saying that it should be more flexible. But let's hold on for a moment, because there may be some problems here. Transition, let us concede, requires a measure of constitutional flexibility. I think that's not too hard a proposition to agree with. But. Going back to the issue of minorities, in order for them to engage with the constitutional process, they need to have some protection from adverse events because they are thinking about what happened from 1947 through the 1950s that everything that they were told didn't come to pass and some things that they would be horrified about did come to pass. So they are naturally very distrustful about this process. Therefore, they need to be reassured that there is something solid in this constitution that they can rely on and how much evidence is there for them to rely on it. So there has to be, I suggest, some rigidity and some flexibility according to the, the provisions. Should minorities be given right in the amendment process, for example, and if so, what right should they have? Undoubtedly, they are going to demand constitutional change in terms of entrenchment of their autonomy, guarantee of their culture and their education system and their language, but they have to be guaranteed that those guarantees will not be taken away. And the only way to do that is through the amendment process. So flexibility across the board is probably not the answer. It may be for many aspects of the Constitution, but not all of them. We've also got to consider if the Constitution is going to be flexible as a transitional pr uh, position, then at what point are we going to reinstate rigidity? When will this work in process be, be over? And I think we should think about this in terms of societies in transition because in a way aren't all societies always in transition? You know, is there that point where you can say we have now achieved transition and we can move on to some other process? I'm a bit honestly skeptical about, about that. So maybe we need a new rule on amendments. There's a broad range of options which I've set out. There you can have total entrenchment of the kind I've described. You can have a special majority in the legislature. Maybe not 75%, maybe 66% might be might be better. Uh, you can have popular consent via referendum or assent by the states, as I described. Or you can have pure parliamentary sovereignty, where there's no special protection of, of provisions. But you can have different methods of amendment or entrenchment for different aspects of the constitutional order. That's not a problem. Most constitutions do that. So the critical issue is the ability of the minorities to control or to block the amendment process. Um, the 75% rule doesn't really protect the minorities because collectively they are already less than 25%. And obviously they're very worried about the implication of the military having control in a way over this process of, of a change. So maybe maybe the idea here would be to provide a consent provision so that some provisions would not be changed unless the presumably autonomous government of, of particular region or regions gives consent to that amendment. That might be uh, 
a way to go. But whether people in Myanmar are going to agree with that is, is hard to say. Um, okay, finally, we've got to consider the role of the, of the, uh, of the military. Um, and uh, so the question really in the amendment process everybody's looking at is how to really marginalize or reduce the involvement of the military in this entire process. So let me just, um, let me just conclude here. Constitutional change is fundamental to the reform process. I've noticed that commentators on Myanmar from every discipline, not just from law, have said how fundamental the constitutional process is to Myanmar's transition. The military stranglehold on the constitution needs to be rescinded, maybe by degrees. If you look at Indonesia, it was done not all at once, but by degrees, and that's been quite successful. I mean, the military really has been marginalized from the constitutional process. One issue I haven't mentioned is, of course, Aung San Suu Kyi's own position with regard to the presidency, and many of the representations were uh, to amend the provision of the constitution which prevents her from being considered for the presidency <clears throat> because of her, her family background, having been married to a British citizen and having two children with, with uh, British citizenship. The current process, I, I, I would suggest, is not going to be the last, so we shouldn't be too dismayed if there's a slowing down of the transition process. I think that is probably what is going to unfold over the next year or so. There's been very rapid transition up to this point, but some of the issues that Mark Saxer was talking about earlier on are now coming out into the general discussion. And, uh, you know, there are many people who still adhere to the idea of what the military calls a discipline flourishing democracy, which is an interesting kind of uh, interesting phrase. I mean, how disciplined can or should a democracy uh, be? But I think that expresses the cautious attitude that a lot of people in, in Myanmar still have towards the issue of, uh, of transition. Uh, so, I mean, to, to just to, to finalize this, um, changing the amendment process is very fundamental to the continued transition of Myanmar. Good decisions have to be made. I think a balanced approach needs to be taken, but part of that balance is going to be to find a way of getting the minorities on board with trust in a way which did not happen in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. That will be crucial because conflict is raging across Burma in many ways. Religion, ethnicity, as well as the politics of transition. And this process has to be kept under control that the ethnic minority issue, the religious issues, could derail the transition completely. That is the danger. So we shouldn't be you know, too impatient for change to happen in, in Myanmar. Thank you very much.